Hello, and welcome to our training on contextual privacy. My name is Amelia Vance, and I'm really excited to talk to you about one of the most important, in my mind, student privacy topics. Today, we're going to understand what contextual privacy is and understand what privacy decisions may need to be adjusted based upon the context of edge cases. So let's begin. Over history, privacy was often defined as control over information about you, with a distinction between private versus public information. But as lines blur, most evidently now with the pandemic, between private and public, and there is a limit to what individuals can actually control of their data. A new theory of how to think about privacy was proposed about a decade ago by scholar Helen Nissenbaum. She said, a right to privacy is neither a right to secrecy nor a right to control, but a right to appropriate flow of personal information finely calibrated systems of social norms or rules govern the flow of personal information in distinct social contexts, for example, education. As discussed in an earlier training, privacy changes depending on context. Think about it. What you want your doctor to know may be different than what you want your child to know or what you want your boss to know. Information isn't private or not private. The situation and the people who you are sharing the information with matters. In other words, certain people may be comfortable sharing certain types of information with some people, but not others, dependent on the context. I may not want my boss to know how many romance novels I read on the weekend, but I will discuss them in detail with my friends. As noted here, privacy is often framed as being able to control information about you, but we don't always have control of information about us. In school, particularly, students, as mentioned in previous trainings, have certain rights to access or challenge information about themselves, but students can't tell their teacher not to call them by their name in class or not collect their test score. And now, as I mentioned more than ever, we know that private and public can be inextricably combined. Once upon a time, private equaled the home, a very separate place from public information, which could be shared broadly. Public was considered civic engagement. Your role is a member of the general public versus the solitude of the home and the family. And it doesn't really matter whether information is private or public under this theory. Uh, it matters what constraints ought to exist when information is going from place to place or from person to person. So an example of con how context matters here. In healthcare environments, uh, you have a ton of devices that are tracking everything about you. Blood pressure monitors, pulse oximeters, uh, all of this add to and supplement uh, the caregivers and enhance the close monitoring and recording of your condition. And is, this is something that we all want that we think of as high quality health care. However, when our local grocery store, someone else watches us through store security cameras, uh, tracks us through loyalty programs, uh, monitors when we open our emails, all of that feels pretty creepy and suspicious and strange. The context is different even though the monitoring may be very similar. So in addition to thinking about context, I also want to get you thinking about edge cases. Leah Kistner 
Chief Privacy Officer at Humo and the former global lead of privacy technology at Google, said in a talk last year, the world is made of edges. Systems are large enough that edge cases aren't. And she said this in the context of a company like Google or Twitter, where so-called edge cases, rare things that pop up, happen every day, happen multiple times each and every day, because the scale of a company like Google, the scale of a company like Twitter is such that rare things happen frequently. You just have so many people. And so I want you to take this and apply it in the student context. What are student circumstances that we think of as edge cases that actually aren't really edge cases that are likely in each and every school? So some potential examples of this. Students with invisible disabilities. We know a huge percentage of the population has some sort of disability. What is, how do we know? What does that look like? How frequently may that occur within a school? What are the accommodations that we aren't providing as educators because we may not know about it or a student themselves may not know about, for example, a mental health condition. What about students who are LGBTQIA with families that would harm or kick them out if they knew? What about students facing abuse at home? What about students who are undocumented or whose families are undocumented? Students who are homeless? Students whose families are migratory? Students who may or may not have access to a computer or tablet may work exclusively on their phone or may not even have access to a phone. Students who, as we've seen in the move to remote learning, may not have access to internet at all or may have metered access or slow internet. Students don't owe us as educators don't owe the school disclosure of any of that above information. And in fact, with some of it, it feels so sensitive that students may be reluctant to say anything, may not want anyone to know because they don't know if they'll be discriminated against or harmed or suffer some social detriment. So how can you protect their privacy anyway? How can you make sure that you're being proactive and thinking of those edge cases as you're applying all of the information about privacy that you're getting throughout this training? So now you're going to do an activity. We're going back to the activity that you did back in the very first training where we asked you to sort some virtual cards about how you'd like your data to be collected or shared. Now we want you to go back to your copy of those Google Slides to do the second activity starting on slide four. Did you skip to this training and miss the first activity or did you lose the link to your copied slides? That's fine. You can use the link in the PowerPoint, the link that is also in the comments to this video to create a new copy and do the activity. You can also directly download the activity if you'd prefer not to do it in Google Slides. Thank you so much for attending this training. We hope you enjoy this activity.